We learn everything we can about playing and coaching beach volleyball. You're always welcome to visit our website, betteratbeach.com, where we have a number of ways for you to get better. We have online training programs, as well as one hour webinars and a membership for every skill where you can take you step by step through tutorials, drills, so you can fix your passing, your setting, your arm swing mechanics, attacking, serving, defense, and blocking. We've also got a number of practice plans for you coaches out there who might really be interested in this conversation we're having today. If you've ever asked yourself, am I really doing this right? We invite you to jump into one of our skill specific courses where we help players erase bad habits and get more control of the game, as well as learn high level strategy and flat out win more matches. Our most popular online program is our 60 day max vertical program, and it's guaranteed to add inches to your vertical leap. If you wanna add mobility, strength, speed, and power to your game, we have the answer. We provide online coaching and mentorship from real professional athletes and coaches, and it's perfect for anyone who wants a coach to take their game to the next level. If you ever want to come and hang out with us on a beautiful beach resort, we have seven-day training vacations where you can hang out with pros and get over 40 hours of training and playing in one week. If you ever want to come to those or bring us out for a clinic, get in touch over at betteratbeach.com. Now, Today, we have a very special guest, somebody who performed at an elite level and is now coaching and directing and businessing at an elite level. So former AVP player and current super coach and club director, Matt Olson. What's up, Matt? Hey, Mark. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. <laughs> of course, man. What's going on? and uh, make some time like you are to jump on this podcast. Pretty excited about it, and uh, I'm glad you threw the little workout piece in your intro there. I was curious as I'm getting older, the uh, the vertical jump is probably my biggest issue these days, so I was going to call you, ask you about that, but you touched on it, and you guys had a workout plan too, so it looks like you guys thought about everything. Pretty cool. Yeah, we keep trying, you know, and mm -hmm. we keep trying to grow, and we're, we're talking off camera about yeah, finding new people, finding great employees and, and finding people who can make you or in your case, you know, your, your company successful. So I, I think I'm going to lead off with two uh, tough questions, which is who did you have around you while you were playing as an AVP player that you can attribute, you know, at least some of the success to? Did you think it was your partners? Did you have a trainer? Did you have a coach? Or was there somebody that was just like a, a mentor that you could look up to? Um, sure. Um, just off the cuff, uh, I've been married a long time. It'll be 18 years this August, which is crazy. Yeah, thank you. Uh, together for 20. And that was like through college and all my AVP and CBVA prior to that. And so uh, extremely supportive wife that just down for whatever I wanted to try. And to be honest, before that, my family structure, my dad was like super into volley and if anyone ever came to any of the pace around then, he would have seen my dad hanging out. So parents before that. So just those around me from like a family structure, like just couldn't be happier that I was doing that. Um, I used to watch AVPs as a kid with my dad and watched all the big court action and Karch and Sinjin and even the women's game and everything. And I was also uh, that kid that would sit there on the floor, like in between commercials of TV, like hand setting up and down. Um, we can talk later about the current hand setting rules if you want, but probably better. Maybe we don't touch on that in my opinion. Uh, I think it's a skill like anything else. I can just leave it at that, I guess. Um, but yeah, I, so from a family standpoint, like extremely supportive family and wife. Um, so that was that. And then I had a couple partners that um, were just amazing that we just hit it off and committed to a full season. And the season, I got fortunate that there was like 13 to 16 events in a season. And, you know, we were in most of them. So like really had some to like bite your teeth into and create a, like a partnership with. So I feel that was a big part of it. A couple different coaches throughout, um, but I, I really kind of fed off that family structure and my partner and just played a ton of volleyball back in the day, like a lot, a lot, probably too much. Have so, well. That's knee jerk, knee jerk reaction. That's my uh, first comment. No, did you ever, you know, sometimes I, I, I get this playing, um, sorry, I'm getting spam calls. Uh, sometimes I get this playing, you know, now that I'm, I'm married, 
my wife never puts pressure on me. She's always like, go play, go play. And every now and then I, I get to feeling like guilty. Like I know I could make a little bit more money doing something else or, or, or providing something else and, you know, taking better at beach and actually going at it full time. Um, instead of the whatever, four or five hours of practice sometimes, you know, per day, did you ever get like a, a guilty feeling while pursuing volleyball goals or was it just never a question for you? Definitely had some guilty feelings. I, I think more as like our life progressed together and, and every volleyball player unfortunately knows this, like trying to pay for your mortgage or whatever it must, might be, that am um, I spending too much time on it because I just spent, I mean, at that time, this is like over 10 years ago where it's like, you know, the flights were more like four or 500 bucks for like a weekend and like, and then I just like uno dosed or whatever. I just like, it almost cost me money. So like that guilt is something that I think in my time and before me, and I got to imagine current day, like that part is tough that you're committing so much time into it. So I felt just guilt and frustration through that. Um, my family's not like independently wealthy. And I don't mean that against anyone. Maybe theirs is, but like the, you know, trying to make ends meet was real. Um, yeah. I often, even through like my best volleyball days, um, I had a like part-time job or even like more of a full-time job on the side. And I was just able to find work. A lot of it was coaching at that time as well, but they could work around my schedule. So yeah. I just stayed busy and I have no problem staying busy, but um, there was definitely some guilt and it was more so just when I was putting a lot more pressure on like the prize money and earnings to like, you know, make our just day to day happen. It's a little weird, right? Because I think like in my twenties, I was, shoot, I have to pay rent. Like I, I need to be able to win this tournament shirts. Sure, it's it's going to be maybe 1500 bucks, um, but it will cover rent. And now I see other actual avenues to make yeah. some money. So instead of, sometimes I find myself instead of working harder on the court, I go, if I put the same amount of hours into a company or into coaching or into, you know, a real estate investment, man, that that'll provide me for two or three more tournaments. But of course, I'll play crappier in the next tournament just because, you know, you, you took a couple hours away from training or playing. Did did you ever go through that? Should I? It, how do you navigate practicing versus paying rent? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. So I, I feel like I would streamline our practices more as I got, you know, had more commitments. Um, and I wasn't sure if you were going there, but I have two children. They're now eight and 10. And my 10 year old, I played for a couple years while she was alive and with us. And then all of a sudden you start throwing in a kid to the mix. And should I be playing right now or, or training, I should say, or should I be trying to find some other more, you know, potentially steady income or whatever. And so that's where it kind of circles back to the family support and my parents like, oh, well, we'll watch the kid go keep playing, keep training. So I had a lot of that and I was fortunate. But that, that's a tough one. And it's also tough as an athlete at, I think, any level. But if you feel that you're not kind of putting in enough time to be successful, that can weigh on you, too. And showing up and having like a subpar performance for me, I was like real quick, like, well, I didn't get to train as much as I normally would in that week prior or I ended up working too much this week. And later in my career, if you want to call it that, like I had some amazing opportunities and I was kind of done to come back and like play a qualifier with someone or whatever. And like working all day, like trying to get things done. So the next day I could play and I drive two hours up to Hermosa and then like literally came out and like threw out my back on like the second swing. And so it was like, <laughs> and for me, it was like writing on the wall that it gave enough enough, but not, not able to put in that time that why once was able to, um, you know, really wait on that. So I don't know for the, like the part-time athlete, I think that's a tough, that's a tough recipe. And mentally, if you can get yourself in that gear that, no, I, I had enough time to train and I'm ready for this, then you know, all the power to you. Um, I personally struggled with that later into my career when just life started happening more. So yeah. it was something that was tough. Do you think coaching is the right avenue? So it, if you got a young kid, he's, he comes from middle or, or lower caste family, and all of a sudden he moves out to California. You know, Like I was from New York, family kept me comfortable, but when I showed up, I literally had, I think, 1800 bucks, maybe. So I could, <laughs> you know, I could put the down payment for the apartment, but I couldn't actually mm -hmm. like pay the first rent until I did something. And I see a lot of players come out to California and it, the, everybody goes in kind of a different direction with, with what side work they have. You know, some of them go um, 
one of my friends is is bartending and i did that in my early 20s and i was like that is not the answer because you're on your feet constantly mm-hmm. your sleep schedule is is rocked and then you're always exposed to that party environment you know so there's a constant temptation if you don't treat it right for me after that then i started by like, combining a lot of coaching and, and personal training with it now i'm like man should i have done like finance or or learn the stock market so i could be off of my feet for the money portion of of growing my volleyball career did, did, do you think that coaching is the right avenue for somebody who wants to get better at the game and is progressing themselves through it or, or through the low pro ranks I think, I think it can be, um, depending what level you get involved in. I mean, it can be financially stable and to be honest, it, or it can be like a total time suck and you're not getting paid real well for your time. Mm-hmm. Similar to the bartending. I mean, my parents owned a pizza restaurant for a long time. So one of my early jobs was like, uh, you know, just being a server. And so I was on my feet the whole time and working a night job. It wasn't the party atmosphere as much, but on my feet that much was kind of brutal. Um, I actually work with quite a few like former athletes of ours that are up in Hermosa in that Manhattan area. And like, I've tried to help them kind of develop what I, I guess what I'd answer is if you're within a good club and they're paying you well for practice time, great. I think like, I believe what you've done really well at is the like small group semi-privates. I I honestly think that's the answer. Um, and I have shared that with multiple people that, you know, it's still an hour to an hour and a half of your time, but you have whatever, two to six athletes. So you're getting compensated better for the same amount of time. Like I've talked coaches out of like the one-on-one private, maybe you're getting the most bang for your buck for one person, but feeling if you can get a small group, I honestly think it's easier and more beneficial for the group, like even, you know, two to four. Um, and then you're getting paid better for it. So all of a sudden, you know, maybe two, like a back to back, like three hours of your day and you just had eight people come through could be pretty fun. You can get some reps in yourself here or there a little bit. And, um, you know, then, then you're done and you made enough to supplement whatever. Um, yeah. I'm sure you're one of those guys. And I've actually heard you are that you can go, you know, coach for six or eight hours straight. Like some people are able to do that. And some are not, to be honest, I, I'm like a front runner, like that first two hour practice, I'm amazing. And I've really had to train myself. If I know I have a back to back or even like a, potentially a third to like, really like, just kind of cruise it out. Um, so that's all to be lived and learned, but um, I'm wearing my new like hoodie action now. So I'm that guy that's got a hood and a hat and just trying to stay out of the sun a little bit. Um, so that's another part of our sport that I was, I'm a surfer and volleyball player and my body, I don't think was designed for that. So <laughs> finance and, you know, sitting inside AC and whatever else might not be a bad way to, to rock your downtime, but I mean, to each his own, I guess. Yeah. I, I, I like your, the take on small groups. Cause I completely agree. And there was a lot of, in the beginning, the way that we were coaching, you know, first it was, we invited people out for camps and then a bunch of people asked for privates and regular classes, a private one-on-one lesson for a coach is brutal physically. Yeah. Um, so, and, and I also don't think that the player gets as much out of a one-on-one as they do with, you know, if they bring at least at minimum one other person so when we started running our privates i said oh you want a one-on-one private sure listen we should get a compliment and they're like what's a compliment i I said it's a player who if you want to work on hitting they're going to be your setter that way i can watch you instead of setting you and I'll, i'll be able to give you better information you'll be able to play like full points so almost every one of our private lessons now we say like hey who are you bringing or should we bring somebody for you? Because we have so many players in Hermosa. They're like, wait, I get to set for an hour. Yeah. yeah. I will work on hand setting for an hour. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. And I, so I, I am much more on the youth. I think you do quite a bit more adult. Like I'm almost, I'm almost exclusively youth myself. We have adult stuff that our club offers, but like that, I, I think like for a youth court that like eight is my number. So like four teams, I can, I can rock a practice all day long, like back of my hand. Um, I feel adult, you got to kind of keep it moving, but it's faster pace. I mean, a lot of people are looking for a workout too. So I feel like if you get them huffing and puffing and then some volleyball instruction, you know, throughout it's, it's a win-win. Um, but yeah, I've shared that quite a bit with some coaches like in your exact, your backyard that like, Hey, shy away from those privates and get some small group stuff going and it might take a little longer to get going, but it's going to be, you're going to get paid better 
and I think it'll be a better experience. So you might have more longevity of those clients potentially too. And if one person cancels, yeah, then it's not ruined. Like you still have the other three and the other three, like, man, we got to find somebody to fill this spot. You know, I, I think setting that, uh, that was something big that we developed. We said, no, 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 you get people to commit to eight weeks, you know, and say, look at the progress you're going to get in eight weeks. Yeah. Then afterwards, if you want to continue with a, like a one by one situation, that's fine. But the best way to start off is with a good commitment. Cause you're going to see the most results if you actually stick to it. And then when you get the commitment up front, you know that they're going to be there and you know that if they're not there, they're going to be upset at themselves. So, yeah. Uh, so. You said something too, right there, like a group of three. I've actually seen some of my like playing coaches as columns. We have a lot of, coaches that come through here that um, through wave in San Diego that they they're looking to keep playing. And so I've actually helped them get like groups of three and where they're actually playing. Cause there's let's, let's if the players pretty good and they're getting with like some, you know, like um, I don't know, medium level adults that are like looking to improve their game. A lot of times they love having like a pro out there with them and giving feedback between like running some drills, you know, with just three people, but then jumping in and playing as the fourth and rotating partners like I've seen, I've seen that work pretty well and that enables the coach to get some reps themselves. If nothing else, just getting more cardio and just kind of getting your sand legs back, which is personally one of my biggest problems these days is just not able to side out over time or at all. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's too bad, buddy, darn it. So conditioning is real. Conditioning yeah. is real. Um, I had an injury at the beginning of this year. I broke my foot and mm. this last week was the first time that I felt fast again. And like, I kept up with the training. I did one legged, um, uh, box squats and I was like in a boot doing my leg workouts. And finally, after I think like 13 weeks post injury, I was like, oh, I can push off with power again. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's bonkers because in my twenties, I never thought that conditioning, I literally didn't think conditioning played a part in beach volleyball because I was so well conditioned, you know, at the end of every rally, I was still standing up here and everybody else is huffing and puffing. I was like, you don't need cardio to play volleyball. But then after an injury, you start realizing, and I guess because I'm getting older, you know, you start realizing like, oh, wait a second. If you can't survive long into the game, that conditioning plays a role. But I just never witnessed AVP players being out of shape. Uh, and I'll give him a knock, but do you, do you remember Hudson? Uh, Hudson yeah. Bates? Yeah. So everybody served him short for a long time. These guys, he was like 235, 240 at 6'5". He had a lot of mass to get around, and it wouldn't happen for a couple of matches. But by the third match of every team serving him short, ran out of gas. Um, and then we had, you know, a bunch more trouble. But it's crazy that that conditioning really does come into play, and that when you're in great shape, you don't even pay attention to it, really. I, I couldn't agree more, um, you know, is that the conditioning part of it, I think is massive. And I think so many players take it for granted. Those that are, you watch the AVP guys, like you guys, like yourself and the whole crew, and they're all in super good shape, like for the most part. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's part of it. I think even like think about CBVAs these days are like, you know, someone looking to get their A or double A or whatever, triple A, like you're, if you're going deep in the tournament, you're, you're playing six, seven games. Like, and the whole idea would be you can still jump inside out towards the end, which is very similar to you did at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone's got different, you know, learning curves and ways to train. But there's no question like how we've kind of first started is that I with a with a partner I had, we would have a full training routine. We usually train before our practices, just the way we did it. And like Kevin Wong was the one player in particular that we just really dove into that. And I remember clear as day, like walking up to matches and like feeling super fit. And it was like part of our little like fire each other up, like after like the first set or like we're in a battle is like, dude, we're in, we're in nothing better shape than these guys are. Like, do you think they're training like we did last week? And we'd like kind of fuel off it a little bit. And it was real for me. And to be honest, like I kind of mentioned earlier, is like to the detriment of later in my career that I'm like, oh, I'm not playing great because I'm not working out as much or playing as much as I was. And so like, it was a real strong mental strength for me early or like throughout my career. And then as I started to taper off, like all of a sudden it became, and it's like where I'm at now, if I like, oh, I can't play a tournament. I'm just, I haven't been training enough. So I think there's some, I don't know. I wish I was a little better about that. And I would love, I would kind of work with our players in our club about that. Like you're saying you got an injury, like you got back, you just got to work yourself through it. And 
maybe you might have a couple of rough tournaments along the run, but just okay. kind of stay the course and you'll be back. Yeah. A couple of rough tournaments indeed. <laughs> I'm not sure if you have or haven't had rough tournaments, but it's, it's part of it and it's real, but an injury, especially as you get older, like they can, they can set you back pretty hard, but mm. sticking at it and, you know, going back to practice is important. Hey, w with wave beach, um, you said you have, did you say you have 25 coaches now? It's summertime, so a little seasonal, but yeah, there's 25 coaches working for us right now. We're running six practices a day, Monday through Thursday at two locations, That's all, all, all youth. So like That's morning incredible. camp stuff, more dedicated, like our elite group. Um, you know, we've got Mike Plachek, one of, he's like my right hand man. He's an amazing coach and he leads like our elite stuff as well as like current college players that are in town. So we've got them as well. And we've got afternoon stuff and we've got adult leagues. It's Were you guys buddies when you played? You yeah, me? we grew up like, um, he's a couple years younger than I am, but like, like rival high schools. And, uh, and then through our like playing career, we're hanging out too. He's a good guy. Nice. Uh, yeah. did you ever get, did you guys ever get the chance to play, uh, with each other? No, we haven't. Uh, a couple like local fun tournaments, but nothing like when we were both like playing quite a bit. Nothing, mm. nothing I'd like to, we, he, when he was, when he was doing his thing, I remember what year it was like 2007, 2008. I mean, time's so long ago. He played with Rush Marchuka and they'd run like super quick offense. Mike was one of the first guys I felt domestically that was like pretty successful running like a quick and like a quick lob. Yeah. And he played, he played tennis. He played tennis at Santa Barbara. I'm pointing cause he's actually training right outside my window right now. So I keep looking over there, <laughs> but uh, you know, that really fast offense. And so he and I, we both ran faster offenses as of players. So we're always um, con conscious and conscientious of that it doesn't work for everybody because we find that our practices, we're always like speeding it up and our elite level athletes, it works really well, but a lot of other players, like, you know, everyone's different. They take time to gather. <laughs> so it's been an interesting for us. Like, if there's an athlete that can really feed off the faster offense. It's I got to admit, it's more fun for both of us. Cause it just kind of brings in those playing days and like kind of working on different things. But, um, but yeah, we never played together just against each other a handful of times. And that's about it. You said it, that the fast offense isn't for everybody. You know, it, I think you've been through it too, but you know that like the Florida players, they all run their, really kind of low set slow hands low set and lots of carving and very like wind experienced i think uh, what type of player should embrace the the small ball like the, the short or quick offense do you think that every volleyball should should eventually move to that like the whole speed and on two game is for everybody or do you think there's still room for the up and down game and is there a specific athlete or a specific body type that should try to embrace one or the other? Sure. Um, I, I don't think there's any one way to play this game. So just to answer the question, like in one statement, I think everyone's different. A um, couple examples I feel like I felt uh, when I was doing my thing and similar to Mike is that uh, a little fast twitchy. Um, I'm a little like anxious. So is he like, I was that guy that was always early for sets. And so eventually my smarter partners would just start lowering my set and, or like, you know, so for me it worked because I would actually even dig, I got like reprimanded by partners. I would dig fast to the net. So if someone didn't feel comfortable, like taking the ball up high, like we were in trouble anyway, but just, yeah, running it, running it fast to help me stay in system. High ball, like just burns me. I've got like, it's brutal. Why, Why do you think? Well, like I have a hard time timing it. Okay. I have a hard time timing it for me. Um, However, I know in Bass and I, when I've seen you play is that you, you run a higher offense. Um, I had the privilege of playing with Jake Gibb one time. It was like sky balls and it was hard. So the other part of that Mark is I enjoy the faster offense. I like setting a faster offense better, whether that's my hands aren't great. I'm not sure, but I like, if I play with someone, they like a high ball. If I'm playing with you and you're telling me like double the antenna, like your first three are going to be double antenna. I guarantee by the end of the set, you're like antenna or lower. <laughs> it's like going to what I feel comfortable or what I feel like your tempo is. But to go back to it, like Jake Gibb, in my opinion, is a really good, I played with Nygaard as well. Same thing. Like Nygaard was on the left and it was like high as I could set it. Matt Prosser as well. High as I could set it up and down, let them get their feet to it, let them reach high and try to beat someone high. Um, I feel like that complements taller players in my opinion, or maybe someone with a really good jump. Maybe, um, I've got a coach right now. He's a little green, but he's like, 
Say it again. You think it's a vertical leap and, and height thing? You know, like I always, I think it's high. I always look at like uh, uh, Nick Lucena and I, I just go, guys, basically hitting a sky ball. Like him and Phil have, have the same set. It's, it's way up and down and, and he kind of does it. And sure. That's, that's one athlete. And I hate just looking at one athlete, but I, I always just thought it was preference, not height. I think Todd Rogers is the same. I mean, my group of players I played is older, but Todd Rogers, like same ball with Phil, like that thing was a sky ball. Yeah. It got windy sometimes. I think would like drift off the net and I'm like, how are you even making and still putting them into just the nastiest corner? Yeah. Um, no, I think it's preference. I, I would agree with you, but like, it's funny cause you mentioned Florida players like low and fast, like Phil and Nick Florida through and through like learning and like they didn't go fast. Um, I think too fast is an issue sometimes as well. Like people get caught up, like if they're out of system, you can't run it quick in my, in my opinion. And you might get away with it against like mediocre competition, but if we're all talking the highest level stuff, you got to go with what works for you. That's right. um, but yeah, I feel that taller player, like a Phil or like, I, I don't know who, would be, like maybe like a Logan Weber is a current guy, like high near the net, let that guy just go be tall and go be an animal versus like low and potentially like shorten his arm swing or something along those lines. Mm. Um, but yeah, I'm cool with preference. Um, I don't know if this is where you're going, but like I, I felt like I was a strong like partner and I was like to a fault, like took too much blame. Um, but I just like the way I like to play. It's how I still like to play. And in turn, I feel like I talk to our athletes. I love this conversation is like, dude, your job is to be the best setter in the world. And like, it doesn't matter like how you set, you should be communicating with your partner about the set they want. And that should be like your goal and I call it in volleyball life is setting them the set they want. So, I mean, if you and I walk out there, my first question to you is going to be like, what side do you want? And second question is how, how can I set you? I mean, that's literally probably question number two. And I think it's super important and gets overlooked these days. But um, I mean, your job as a partner is to set your partner, however they want to be set, whether you like it or not. So you tell me high ball, I'm gonna do my best, but I'm also going to start bringing you down as we go. Yeah. <laughs> the little like secret, like, I, yeah, yeah. I kind of know better than you. Yeah. yeah. We'll launch you. Uh, I, yeah. That's I'm a soundbite right there. And, and I, I think that's the conversation of when players meet or, or they show up to the tournament for the first time, you know, like two CBVA players or, or East end players mm -hmm. in, in New York that they'll show up to a tournament and they'll say, you know, how do you like your sets? Kind of medium. And after one or two, they're like, that's good. But they never actually define it. You know, it, like that's good because it was slow in your hands, uh, but it still got high enough. You know, that's good because it was four balls above the antenna. And then they never stay for the third, fourth, and fifth set and say, that was one ball too high for perfect. You know, mm -hmm. that was, you know, two balls too low for perfect. And I think it, it, Adam Roberts, I loved playing with him and, and I steal one of his lines all the time. He says, hey, was that set an eight or a nine out of 10? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm like, oh, this is a nine. He goes, what would make it a 10? You know, and that's like his that. line. Like and I'm that. like, that's golden. That's <laughs> yeah. What would make it perfect? Like, how does it need to change to be perfect? And that I think that's an important thing that people need to go through. I think it's important at all levels. Yeah. And as a partner, you should want to know what, what a 10 is for them to Adam's. Adam's a really good setter too. So it's always, it's fun. And I felt like I was at one point. So I prided myself in trying to like get my partner a perfect set. And I'll admit like guys like Jason ring, I had the hardest time finding him. He's a high leaper and wanted a fastball. And for whatever reason, I just couldn't find it. And I just think that you have connections. That's why you play better with some partners and maybe the way you set them or the way they set you. And that's why some partnerships work and some don't, even if it looks amazing on paper. So yeah, it's, welcome, it's welcome to our sport. You know, like um, Brandon, who I'm, I'm playing with now, he's got like faster indoor hands. He's been playing beach for a bit, but no one's ever shifted his hands from indoor to beach. So while the location comes out correct, the, the, the rhythm sometimes feels a little disjointed. And that's similar to like Lev Prima. He's got very fast hands. And I like the, I'll, I'll call them Florida hands, but like, the, the deep wrists, I'm not saying deep hands, but the deep wrists where you see somebody kind of control the ball. I like those, even though the FIVB is completely annihilating any ability right to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sort of um, but it, it's interesting that even the, the hand rhythm, like how deep the hands or wrists bends back, that can create, can create or ruin somebody's timing. And 
like you were saying, if you can get somebody who prides themselves not on how they set, but on how they they can match what their partner wants, that's a big deal. And I, th- one of the problems is that it just becomes such an uncomfortable talk because you have to change something that somebody's been doing for five, 10, 20 years and say, this is how I like it. Is, do, you, do you know if there's a good way to approach that? You know, or do you just say, this is the set I want and need, and then you just stay picky? So a couple of things you said, I agree with everything you're saying is the one thing I've heard partners like request to have the partner stop hand setting them like, Hey, can you bump set me or vice versa? Like, can you hand set me? I hit better off a hand setter or I hit better off a bump setter. I think that's a little stigma in their head in my opinion, but I've heard that multiple times with partners I've had and like opponents I've been playing against. Um, so I sorry, a little off topic there, kind of, but no, I, and I agree. I, hate that something. I look at players that say that I'm like the balls, the balls up there, even though I'm talking right. about like the rhythm of Brandon's hands, right? The balls up there. Now it's your job to feast. I think it's to your point though, that like the slower handset versus the fast is that timing where like a, like a longer bump set is going to give that player more time to track it. Mm. Um, so just thinking out loud with you. But um, I found the awkward conversation of let's call it constructive feedback, I think is a good way to look at it is I think, like I mentioned early on in a partnership, like you roll up with someone like you're sorting that out. Um, I feel that I was also, and I hate referencing myself as a player, but I guess on this podcast, it's not a terrible thing to do. But like, if I felt like I made a, a crap set and or I could tell that it's not what they wanted or what we discussed, I would just own it right off the bat. Like, oh shoot. Like to Adam's point, like that, that was bad. I, I, I got to get you in there. I got to get you higher. I got to get you lower, whatever they had asked for and try to like kind of own it a little bit to like ease off them. Like, oh shoot, like I just didn't get the set I wanted. Yeah. And I feel like obviously during competition, and especially if you're down or in a heated match, it's going to be more, more real. And it's going to be then how is that conversation being handled? And all of us that are in coaching, like I can't, I used to do as a player. So it's like, it's a, been a learning curve for me, but like, set me higher, like set me tighter. It's like, uh, okay. Like trying to have partnerships. I, it's, I'm really trying to create partnerships with these young athletes I'm working with and just trying to be like, Hey, like, you know, during a timeout or whatever, if I can get them aside, like, Hey, you got to communicate in a little you know, more friendly way or a little more constructive way with your partner versus kind of like barking at them what you want because they just shut down and now you've lost whatever momentum you had so that is it can be an awkward conversation i feel like if the setter is really doing their best to try to give them the best set possible and you know kind of maybe owns up when they didn't or like hey i'm gonna get that higher um it can help i've uh, been through it where i'm just like bump setting garbage and i keep saying i'm gonna fix it and it's not getting fixed and they're probably getting more frustrated at me because i keep saying i'm gonna fix it and they didn't so i gotta admit i've been on that side of it but i just think in general just kind of being cool is something we always say and just you know you know all those things you've learned just be nice and don't say something you wouldn't want someone saying to you and etc 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 so sticky specific actionable words because be nice be cool the more i maybe the the older i've gotten the more i realize like people need to be handheld like when you say be nice to somebody, they can interpret that in completely different ways. Me being nice to somebody is sarcastically making fun of them because like I want them to giggle, but I realize that 99% of people don't get my humor and then it shuts everybody down. Like this guy's a dick. Yeah. <laughs> so do you have any specific words or ways to phrase that you teach your young athletes when they're communicating with partners? Like in I first instead of a you first or a don't tell a suggest anything like that. I don't, I don't have anything great to be honest. Um, We do say be cool if it's like elevated and just kind of try to elaborate a little on that conversation. Just like, Hey, I think, yeah, I just try to like talk them through to be honest. I just had this recent uh, tournament where two athletes were just like totally gelling. Things are working well, everything's going their way and it's like, couldn't be better. The communication is super positive. And then it gets tight and it goes the absolute opposite. And like that reference of like, set me tighter. And like the next one's like, set me further off or set me higher. And it's just like, oh, so trying to pull them inside and just like having them be aware of it. And it could be like in a private situation, like you talked about earlier, like, hey, you guys, and everything was going really well and your legs were doing great. You guys were super positive and communicating. The 
you know, and the conversation's gotten a little more negative and I feel like it's not helping either one of you. So trying to talk through that. But Mark, I wish I had a couple like gems on that front. I, I, I don't, we just say be cool, but that's like, honestly, like a kind of a company line on all sorts of stuff. <laughs> like with kind of the culture of our program and just like the whole thing, like, you know, one for us running a beach volleyball club is, you know, the partnerships are everything, literally everything. Safety, then partnerships is how we kind of word it. But if they're not enjoying their partner, some athletes will come up to the coach and like in a polite way, like ask about a partner change. Sometimes they'll like walk up right in front of their partner, like, hey, are we changing partners this next round. And it's like, oh, like it's oh. this poor little, oh, it happens all the time. <laughs> and so trying to be cool and just kind of communicate that situation a little differently is something we've worked through. But I don't have a, even after, I mean, I'm running, the, this will be year 13 this fall. And I don't have a ton of like gems on this front. It's something we just try to talk about being a good partner, a cool partner, and you're trying to do your best to help your partner in order to get the most out of them. That's a big one that coach Mike and I use a lot. Um, yeah, but nothing like no, like awesome cue or quick word on it. Yeah. I, I've talked to a few people, you know, I'm trying to, trying to be better at marriage and relationship and stuff. So I'm like, all right, you got to figure out how to, talk and communicate and, and what the right way to, to say something is for you. So I, uh, I read this a few marriage counseling books and then I started taking those questions and I stole them and I put this into the, what's on the screen below us. It's like the partner profile. It's like, mm -hmm. Hey, let's look at these questions. Let's say, uh, what are your turn offs? What are your turn ons? Like, like write down a word that if your partner said it in any way, or write down a phrase that if your partner said it, it would completely shut you off. Like you would, you just 99% of the time you're mad at somebody who says something like that. Um, and there's a bunch of questions in there that I think people really enjoy answering. So if anybody wants to check out nice. the questions that we have for partners, just go to betteratbeach.com forward slash partner profile. And you can answer the questions that help you learn about yourself and hopefully, hopefully learn to communicate with partners a little bit better. I, I think the pro level, I know the pro level is different in my opinion. I actually still have to say think, but uh, the partner thing is really tough for us at the beach club level and youth level is that everyone wants someone in their mind that is as good as them, as good as them, if not better. And so when you got the whole clubs looking for that, it's really tough. So like one thing for anyone that's listening, I really feel that uh, we should be, you know, you should be giving someone a chance. If you feel like it's like close to your level or it might work out, like give it a try, especially like lower kind of lower CBVA level or the youth levels. And you just never know what happens because sometimes that partner you've been like dreaming of, they would say yes to you, like you get in the sand together and it's like, doesn't work. And in turn, like if everyone's looking for someone as good as them or better, it makes it a really tough situation. So that's like one of our biggest things with the beach club is partnering. And like some of like, there's some clubs in the past that have like no, no bench on the beach because indoor it's all about playtime yeah. and beach. It's all about partners. In my opinion, it's like the hardest thing. I, we lose players and we gain players because either the director like was putting them with someone that's not that good consistently, or they're not finding partners in that club. So they're hoping to come to our club and find better partners. Yeah. Um, it's rare that they're kind of looking more at themselves to why that might be. But uh, just subtly trying to work through that. So to your point of, you know, answer these questions, like that would be great. I'm actually curious to take a look and see if I can't get our club to run through that a little bit because finding some more partners or more partner options would make my job a lot easier on a lot of levels. <laughs> yeah. It's fun. It, some of the things that, so we asked like, okay, what's, what's, what's the best way to, to react um, when you, when you want to get fired up? Cause for me, it's, let's beat these mofos up like th they are the other team is trying to take something from us i have your back fully and 100 percent. let's go get them um and when i in utah i was doing the open level groups and all of the guys i'd say like eight out of ten guys they're like yeah i like that attitude i like that that's a good way to fire me up and <laughs> there was only one of the women the open women who appreciated that all of the other said being mean to the other team was a complete turnoff, something that they wanted like no part of. And that, at, I guess I was 35 at the time. I was like, man, what a, a growth. Just this one meeting this morning, asking two different sets of players this one question saying, huh, 
I have to change the way I fire somebody up or the way I talk about getting fired mm -hmm. somebody up based on the athlete. You know, some people want the war, the battle, the enemy, and some people want the connection with their partner more than, more than that. So interesting I, questions. Yeah. Our boys beach side of the club has grown, but yeah, we're like 90% female and it's, there's a lot of that connection is huge. Like I, I rarely, there's very few athletes, probably about what you said, like a one to 10, it sounded like that like it would be that like let's go out there and like you know step on this team's neck like that is yeah. not how i rally the teams that to be honest ever um guys i think much more so i was i said earlier in the in the this podcast that uh, my dad like pretty much he's a really nice person but he's a big dude he's like six two like 220 and he's like pretty fit like early on and it was like you know like i don't want to sound weird matt but like we we want to kill that other side and it was like oh, okay dad like and he taught us that like pretty early on and uh, still very i feel like i'm a very respectful player like slapping hands and you know for the most part not getting in arguments with the opposing side but uh yeah i gotta admit like as funny as i'll be in the warm-up and try to butter up my opponents kind of back in the day like i i was i was looking for blood there's no question about it and a couple of the partners i had that would have that reference like literally like all right it's we're up 16 12 or whatever like let's step on their neck right now it's like kink like it totally totally worked for me and uh just try to put keep your foot on the gas but it's easier said than done at times but uh i would have i would have liked that conversation you gave for sure no it'll be fun check it out so if anybody else is interested um just it's it's just a free assessment you get the results uh, after you ask the questions and it, it'll be interesting for you to have to go through those questions for yourself and to ask your partner to go through the same and just compare your answers after but it's better at beach.com forward slash partner profile it's just a bunch of questions that, that uh you can answer and it, it might help you out in your volleyball game i think understanding what you want is important too because part of that setting talk we talked about earlier is that like you know you have to convey to your partner what type of set you like and so similar to what i feel your partner profile would do is it starts to like kind of jog your memory to what you're actually looking for so maybe that'll help sort it out because partners is real in the sport at all levels now avp champion you know talking to an, an avp champion which is sweet yeah to, to be able to get that um and you won two uh, pro titles right because you you won a huntington and hermosa is that correct? so there's uh, i'll be super transparent i've always been transparent yes on bvb info which i love bv info by the way they have two titles to my name uh kevin wong and i won the belmar open um there's belmar in new jersey it's close ish to you i think yeah uh at that time, and again, I've always said this to anyone who brings it up, the top three, if not four teams were traveling for FIVBs Olympics at that time. So one, as I've called like a watered down event, if you want to call it that. Um, some gnarly teams were still there and someone had to win. So I'm very fortunate to this day that we did, but just throwing that out there and I'm throwing that out there because the other one on my title was like, not, it shouldn't be on there. Uh, Matt Prosser and I won a little tournament at Huntington that was like, a three team invite that Hans Stolfus, you remember that name was like yeah, remarketing for the AVP and it was like an invite only thing. And somehow that got thrown on there is like a win, which it was pretty much an exhibition. But <laughs> if they want to throw it on there too, I'll, win take, win. I'll take two. <laughs> uh, to be transparent for uh, yourself and whoever we made, uh, Kevin and I made the finals of Manhattan. Um, I made the final for most of the J ring, but the final in Manhattan, like to this day, I love winning Belmar. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but I, when I circle back and I go down that rabbit hole a little bit, like trying to side out against Gibbon Rosie in Manhattan was amazing. So, and I still walk that pier. I was just there and like, see their, see their plaque. And it's like, Oh, dang it. <laughs> what else are you going to get? I took a third there as well. I think a couple of times, but uh, that second was pretty memorable and amazing. Yeah. And I mean, a third, I mean, like I had a, a fifth in Manhattan a few years ago at Kurt Topple, and you think I, I walked home. Well, actually, I sprinted uh, back to Hermosa because I had a beginner's class as soon as I <laughs> left my evening nice. match. Nice. So I got on my bike because I was just like gunning it. And they're like, wait, you were just playing? I was like, yeah, but that's not important right now. Like, <laughs> come on, we got to get to practice. Yeah. And I was after that, I was like a little bummed out that, that we, we couldn't couldn't get to that next level. And we got embarrassed on stadium court, uh, by Darty. And one of my mentors coaches at the time, uh, you might know him, Matt Davis. Mm -hmm. And he said like, uh, 
at that tournament, that finish, it's a, it's a dream finish for most of the people in the world. So he's like, you have to be like happy, like you just PR'd. So if you get a good win, you know, if you get something where you're excited about, you just, you hit a new peak. So now it's time to, to move on from there, but enjoy a little bit of the win first. Yeah. I mean, Manhattan was always it for me. I think everyone's got their, their tournament or their location or the venue or whatever for me in Manhattan, just growing up watching the sport and then just knowing the history at that location for me is like everything. Uh, pretty rad. There was, that was like a big one too. That was like a 60, 14 draw. And it's like when they had, the, yeah, it's like back, they had a couple of those when I was playing. It's pretty amazing. It's a big field and the energy and just super rad top to bottom. So, yeah. Um, you talked about being able to some players bark at each other. Was there any one partner where you guys thought that you guys would be great together, but you just couldn't get along in terms of getting along? You know, where you always tried to decide who was the coach and who wasn't, or or that relationship dynamic. You're just like excited to play, but it just kind of didn't work out. Um, nothing like blaring, like, oh my gosh, like this guy and I just never saw eye to eye. Uh, actually, I mentioned his name, Hans Stolfus, earlier. I, I, I love that man, and I haven't seen him in a long time, unfortunately. And we went to Australia together um, right after my wife and I got married, like early on. We did that little three month tour, mm -hmm. and we won one of them. We won a couple of little ones. We won one of the events. And to be honest, we were like not on speaking terms, like most of the tournament, like literally, like at each other the whole time. And I, I was super young then. I don't know what he'd say, but I'll, I'll take some blame for my, you know, I don't know, being a little baby, but he, uh, he was great. And like first game, uh, first match of the tournament, we were like at each other and literally just like put on our big boy pants and sided out and didn't slap hands much and like ended up winning the tournament. Um, we didn't play after we got back from that trip. We stayed close and just kind of were cool about it. But he's one player in particular I just I had a hard time. He wanted to coach on the court, I think, more than I wanted to listen at the yeah. time. And we're both pretty close in age. He's a little older than I was. And I maybe I just didn't, I don't know, I just didn't see him in that role and or I didn't have many other like player coaches that I'd played with at that time. So it, that's one person. I don't feel like I really threw him under the bus, but he uh, he and I didn't always see eye to eye on that front. Most of my partners, um, even if we didn't have great finishes, I thoroughly enjoyed playing with them. That was a big thing for me is like you're traveling so much with someone you better better enjoy it and like i said hans and i had that one tournament where like it worked out and i heard stories like kent and karch back in the day like pretty much like did not like each other and still like we're winning like 24 of 27 or something ridiculous um i feel like that's a pretty big exception in my opinion and i don't know i think the life's too short to go through that with someone for an entire season but um it might happen and uh I'd rather try to win some games and who knows, maybe the tournament versus uh, let our disappointments take the better of us. It's one of those questions that we have on the on the partner profile. Um, but one of the questions we ask is how how much do you want your partner to coach you? Say, like, what are you working on this practice? And how many times would you find it acceptable if they offered advice on what you're working on? You know, and you could answer zero three four five and be like okay you know so when me and brandon play together and he told me what he was working on i was like okay i have three opportunities to give him advice on that mm -hmm. and like that's my cap so when at one point when i wanted to like suggest it, i was like maybe i'll just save it a little bit you know <laughs> maybe i'll save one of my three and i think that that could be a little helpful thing it you know saying like you're allowed to give your partner tips so many times but i also i I always wonder about everybody's inner dynamic between teams of do you sit down and you have the conversation of, Hey, one of us is, is steering the boat you know, or driving the boat or whatever you want to say. Um, and how many coach versus just one-on-one -on -one equal heads coming together partnerships there actually are. And it's such a, it's such a unique conversation because it's so different for every team. Mm -hmm. I think that's a huge one, like being coached on the court or do you want to be coached? Cause I think there's some players that like love coaching. Um, maybe they're a coach or not just comes to them naturally or however you want to look at it. But I honestly think a lot of players don't want to hear that on the court when they're playing, especially more advanced players in my opinion. So I think it is something really good to put in there. Cause there's definitely people that love coaching throughout. And I mentioned Hans, there's been a couple other coaches I've had that are partners that I've had that want to do that. And I had a, it wasn't great for me 
kind of took some of my focus off um, for me personally. Another one on there, maybe you guys have it. It's a random one, but like, how much do you like to warm up? Or like, do you have like an extensive warm up routine before you play? Because I love Ty Loomis, <laughs> literally love that dude, but his warm up is so darn long. <laughs> I, I, it threw me off so bad. We played some like opens together back in the days of little stuff. And I doubt he's listening to this right now, or maybe he is, but I love that dude. But his warm up is so long. So I don't know, that could be an idea for your questionnaire if you don't have it already is like, how important are warm ups to you? Cause some people like like super long pepper and then like I got to run for 30 minutes before or, like you and I both have heard like the AVP warm up or whatever. Um, I was it's so ridiculous because the AVP, like they give you 10 minutes, you know, like no AVP warm ups here, bro. I was like, an AVP, you step on the court, now you got nine and a half minutes, you know? Well, everyone says that everything. term, right? I mean, yeah. you're like me I mean, or vice versa. We both played a gazillion tournaments all over the U S and like, it's always a knock like, oh, open level player. Like you guys take so long to warm up or whatever. No AVP warm ups here or whatever. It's always, it's just kind of a knock. Um, I was a really quick warm up person again, maybe to a fault, but it was not, it didn't need to be the same thing for me either personally. Cause some people have like a total routine. I had a routine at one point for like the, like physical warm up, like the jogging portion, but for the most part, um, it's kind of random. Uh, I played the guy named Jimmy Nichols back in the day. Yeah. And that guy would literally, it was like the greatest experience I ever had as a young player for one. It's like another side conversation, but he was the absolute worst. It's, we'd be playing an AVP tournament and the guy's just like talking to whomever. I have no idea. I'm like warming up like with the other team there or like having the ref set me or something. I'm like a 20 year old kid trying to figure this out. And the guy was never there. It was so gnarly. <laughs> and I came to love it. And it's like an ongoing conversation now with he and I. But he would roll up, like, kick his, like, Crocs off or whatever he was wearing and hit, like, two or three balls and, like, okay. And then he'd always, like, ask the ref for more time. And it would, like, be his lead-in to being a total pain to the ref. So he'd, like, <laughs> kind of be pushing for more time. And that guy worked the refs, like, crazy. Super fun. That's that's my modern-day Kurt Topple. I, uh, you know, got a 6'9", 40-inch vertical guy. And I yeah. was stoked to have him. But I had to take the, like, kind of pit bull, hard worker, grind mentality out of my head because he was there to have fun like he's he's hyper intelligent super smart and he's got a million ideas every day um so for him volleyball beach volleyball is always fun yeah like it had to be fun uh otherwise you would just lose him and i get it and it's, it should still be fun for most people because we're not making enough money for it to not be fun really mm -hmm. uh and he would just his warm-up was kind of like maybe jogging in place and just chatting up the other team or chatting up whoever's on the side and in the beginning, it drove me crazy, but then I realized, like, if I'm going to hold on to this monster, I got to let him do whatever the hell he wants, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jimmy was the same way. And, like, I actually, like, became – I ended up loving it, and maybe it changed the way I warmed up. But it was super fun, and it was what he wanted, and he made the game fun. Like, I, I had as much fun with him playing as I did with anybody. It, it was fun. So – I like that. I didn't, I don't know Kurt very well. I know him, but I don't know him very well. And I've heard some similar stories. So I actually going to wrap with him a little bit when I see him next. He's like one of the most fun people to just hang out with at any, any time, any venue. He's like, uh, he, you know, he's sporty, he's intelligent. He's got a lot of ideas and he's super loquacious. So if you don't want to carry a conversation, he'll carry it with 19 other people for you. So it looks like your team is social, you know? <laughs> nice. Nice. Well, cool. um, I want to talk a little bit for, uh, if we haven't lost them yet, uh, everybody who is creating a business out of volleyball, out of coaching, out of directing. And we touched on being able to at least create small groups, you know, when you're coaching. But you have, do you have one of the largest beach volleyball clubs in the U.S.? I mean, to have 25 coaches. Is I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure we do. Why? I, I guess I just did that big gauntlet. So for my world, like the three weeks in the kind of heart of July, the middle of July, there's like back to back to back four national beach championships and I have a lot of conversations throughout. I, it could be wrong, but I mean, I'm not even patting myself on the back because it's so much work, but I, I, I think we're the largest, I think. Um, or one, of, one of them for sure. I, we got to be in the runnings. I mean, two, two facilities uh, or two you know, sites. We ended the spring with like over 300 athletes. There's a gazillion programs, boys, girls, um, adult leagues, et cetera. So I, I think we're pretty close. What were the mistakes that you made in the first few years of starting directing a club that would be the first sets of advice 
that you give to somebody who is just about to get into it? You know, what did you say? Hey, this is what I did. Don't do this, do this instead. Um, there's nothing that really like extremely jumps out at me. Cause I think we just learned through so many like small mistakes, if you will, and, like nothing like catastrophic that we almost lost a club because of this. Um, I do think a couple things is like, get ready to grind. Um, it is a lot of work a lot. And, um, the biggest thing for beach is that I feel there's a lot of pros that have gone out there, um, before me during my time or whatever, and expected that they're just going to get this huge turnout because of their name. Uh, I'm sorry to break it to you, but little 15 year old Susie doesn't know who Phil Dahlhauser is or who Alex Kleinman is like, they have no idea. So it's, it's about personalities and not even, I don't like using the word relationships because I feel like we've got a really healthy, like player to coach relationship in our club, but it's about connecting with these athletes and being humble, to be honest. I mean, I used the term being cool earlier. I think being humble is a huge part of it. And you've got to dive in. And I know I've seen you, Mark, you do it. You've got to dive in with your privates. You've got to dive in with your small groups. And you got to dive in with your club and be personable and work on learning names, creating a safe environment, and just kind of making some of those connections. And I think one big mistake, and I've had people that don't understand this, is you might have like 15 youth at a practice and maybe you market it as like 7th through 12th grade. So you just literally have 15 kids out there, seventh through 12th grade. And I'm not kidding. You're going to have five ability levels amongst those 15 and how you coach that is really difficult because what this is a big, this is a, this is to answer your question is that people don't understand that on with 15, you can run it on one court probably, but you might need three courts and three coaches to make it challenging for the group. And it's really hard to understand that. So just knowing it's trying to cater to the different levels. Cause we talked about partners, but I mean, my inbox is full. I had two this morning and I had a parent that met me at the beach before our nine to 11, that they want their part, their daughter changed, uh, her partner changed because she's not getting pushed and they got moved to a lower court. So like the courts and keeping each court and each athlete challenged is, is everything. Um, so that's a big one. The other one is, is try to like on your lowest court, like we've got some pretty low level, like brand new, gotta be super fun. And you have to have like a bubbly coach down there that can totally kill it. And it doesn't need to be a pro It's actually, I suggest it wasn't. And someone that coaches locally or is like a elementary school teacher or something along those lines, if you're looking to like, Hey, I want to coach all the top stuff. Cause that's like my jam or whatever, like get someone that can do the lower courts. Um, because I can coach the lower courts all day, but as far as like for a whole, like to your point, like an eight week season, I, I pretty much pulled my hair out uh, pretty easy into it. So I give you like 10 different things right there. I'm not sure what the, the best gem, little gem is, but just that different ability levels in a larger group is really important. And you got to be able to break them up on the courts if you want to keep them for, for a while, because little Susie, who's like, you know, has some pretty good beach experience. If she's partnered with someone with none or they're all even on the same court together, like it, it doesn't last. So right. being able to, yeah, it's really, really tough in our sport. And people, it's a slow start and you might not be making much at the beginning because you're going to have, you're going to be overstaffed. And it's just part of it. You got to weather the storm a little bit. Yeah, we've got three pages on exactly that uh, on our yeah. on our coaching manuals of what to do and multiple solutions for like different skill levels on your court. Because when we were first starting out, everybody was at a completely different level, you know. So I, I was bringing people from around the country to say, "All right, stay here for a week." And we literally had beginners and pro mm -hmm. players, and I had to coach them at the same time. And there, there are ways to keep them on the same court and keep the multiple engagements. It won't last very long. So you could do that for like two weeks, but over time, somebody's just going to start looking the other way and saying like, I, you know, I need to battle while I'm here and have that, but at least short term, th there are good answers. And if the coach has to jump in to be the, the, the team that the good players play against, you know, that's one of them. Or when you have that, that real beginner that all of a sudden just comes into the group and it's random, like, all right, well, you're going to have to partner with them half the time for their drills and say like, you know, back it up so that none of the elite players are, are messing up their rhythm. But I agree. That is the hardest and probably the, the hardest to explain to somebody else it's, how, how to figure out and do it successfully. It's tough. 
and it doesn't it doesn't stop like it's it's constant for us like bigger numbers is obviously financially amazing mm. and it's the energy is so much better like lower numbers is it can be really tough and especially if you're breaking it up and you've got like two or three or four on a court like it's hard to run a two-hour practice at the lower levels at the younger levels i should say the other one is and you touched on it but um my coaches have been with me for a while think i'm like an idiot and overstaff things and maybe to a certain point i do um we're all, we do well, but it's not like I'm retiring anytime soon. So it's not about the money for one, but like we have an extra coach at every session, literally like an extra. And we do, I don't mean to, we have an extra female coach at every session and like their job is to help, help if there's a court that's like a little overloaded or whatever, but normally they, we put them on a court to play. Oh, because so you have a, a, a float coach. Floater, like a roamer. Okay. Oh, and they could go to any court that they want and, and jump yeah. in when they not a, not an extra coach per court. No one. Like how are you could, even uh, still one one per session? So some some practices we have up to six courts. Most are three or four, depending. Like our sand facility, outdoor sand facility is three courts, and so I'll have an extra one extra roaming court coach for that group. And even in the four court, we'll just have one extra coach. And generally, we have it's either like an athlete in our program or a local high school student. And so we can pay them just whatever, uh, you know, a, a normal working wage, but they also, they can jump in and make it even because you and I in a court or like a lot of others, like if it's odd, like, okay, we'll mix through, we'll make the most of it. That's not the norm in my opinion, like um, youth level athletes. And even some of our elite, they have a hard time if it's odd because they're just, again, to use it, they're not that cool and they won't like include little Susie over there and it ends up being odd. So we have a, a coach that we add add in to make it even. And sometimes a coach, like to your point, will be with the best player in the group and to make it like more challenging on that top court. But more often it's like they're with the lowest to bring the level of play up where it's not, you know, detriment to the rest of the group or like a rally killer or whatever else it might be. So that's another one. How do, do you teach your coaches and your coaching staff a, a specific way to feed drills? You know, should there be if you see a coach hitting too many balls uh, to start a drill, do you tell a, a player to move into that hitting role? Where do you find the balance of coach involvement on the court? Yeah, I think this is probably even like another like bigger conversation. I love I love the question. So we do we so let's let's put it this way. And I'm going to talk more about like the more like the elite half of our club is it's very fast moving. Um, we do a lot of we'll like alternate. So we call it like coach led or player led. Player led is more more often than not like a serving type of situation. Um, but I, to be honest, I don't love like a practice where the athletes are just serving and playing the whole time. Even with like coach interaction, I think it's just it's funky. And it, I've got a lot of coaches there, and it kind of pulls them out. We do a lot of coach led kind of situations where we'll like introduce a ball in a variety of ways and then have the athletes play it out. It looks like a queen of the court if you're like a parent watching from 200 yards away. But generally, there is some emphasis or purpose to every drill or the how we're initiating it. Um, uh, okay, so if you're working on hard-driven digs or or hands digs, the coach will start by hammering a ball at the forearms or at the face to say, yep. like, this is what we're emphasizing. Yeah, we'll talk about it beforehand as a group. And then usually, like, there's one lead and we branch out on the three or four courts we have on those sessions. And like you said, yeah, if it's that drill, we're hitting, you know, their platform or to the left or right of their platform. And we've already discussed how we want them moving their shoulders and then we can coach through it. And as you know, like, you know, then the setters starting at the net or they're starting a base and they're squaring up and all that fun stuff. Um, but yeah, I'm not big on the athlete needs to introduce, like if we're doing some of that drill where it should be the player hitting at their own partner, I get it. Um, I honestly think a coach can hit it more precise to where like the specific drill we're trying to work on and also keep the thing moving because we are fortunate, at least we're what we were, the last year and a half that like we have like full sessions so we're like eight to ten athletes on a court and we need to be like moving i i can't stand lines whether it's my own add or whatever okay. else but like <laughs> i think that's oh, the first thing in, in our coaching manual is no yeah. lines <laughs> no lines and uh, the conversations should be maybe really short in my opinion i think there's a time and place for like a longer breakdown and maybe it's like a lesson um, but I think like a lot of coaching on the fly is how I've heard it referred to that. Like you're coaching between drills. I love if like the athletes are serving that like little I keep using the word Susie. So I'll just keep going. Like little Susie comes off the court, She's I'll a great walk athlete. with her like back towards the service line and just like talk, talk, talk. And then like, let her go where I didn't interrupt the drill. I didn't inter interrupt her reps. 
and I gave her what I felt was some useful information. So that's like big for us. And I just, I just tell my coaches like, look, I, I can only go off experience, but like, I'm good for like 10, 15 seconds of someone like giving me some like in-depth information. And I know half this group is the same way. Cause like when you're talking, I'm watching the body language and like, they're looking for butterflies. Yeah. So we just, we keep it moving fast. We keep all of our practices at our club are two hours or less. So the elite athletes are two hours. The, there's some like younger third through six programs, like an hour and a half or an hour 45. Um, and we just do like, we start on time and we do a dynamic warm up, jump into some pepper progression and we just keep it moving. And I just try to keep my coaches. I mean, I'm sure your manual says similar, but they're like constantly coaching. I can't stand it when there's like a pepper progression going on. I got two of my coaches like rapping about the tournament of the weekend or whatever. Like it's yeah. like, this is a wonderful time to fix yeah, platforms. Arm, to coach. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Just fix platforms and make connections. I also have a hard time standing in place. <laughs> you having me sit down right now for an hour and a half, <laughs> an hour five is a lot for me. Um, so I'm constantly moving around the courts and um, you know, I love, I think like learning names and like all that stuff is super important. It goes back to that. You know, I feel like I'm approachable with our athletes, whether I run this club or whatever. Like I feel like even our younger athletes, like, Hey coach Matt, like it's just, I've taken, I've like taken down that wall or that shield or whatever, and just been very available to a point too much, too available where you and I spoke a little off camera, but my entire club still has my cell phone and my direct email. So that's why I was fired up with the way you set me up on this podcast and impressed that uh, I've delegated well in the coaching and this and that, but I am still the direct line of communication. So I know it fuels us, but uh Make sure that uh, when you start and you think you might have 50, someday you might have 300 and you got to make a decision what to do. Yeah. So going backwards on that one. No, yeah. I, I, I like what you say about coaching on the fly. That's to be able to feed while coaching. You know, that's, that's a big one. Like you can run yeah. the drill while you coach, but if a coach stops the entire drill, the entire court to speak to one athlete on one very specific thing for her, you, the 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 net sum is that you've lost because you've lost the time from seven athletes or nine athletes to give a, you know 20 seconds of feedback to one so the net means that you you lost in that situation yeah. and um that's got to be a focus for more coaches to there are some talky coaches out there we've all had them <laughs> but you just got to figure out a way to like get the drill to keep going I, I believe it wholeheartedly like their and their families. I mean, our sessions are reasonable, but it's not cheap and private lessons aren't cheap. I mean, if a coach, if it's like a one-on-one -on -one and they want to hear a lot of information, great. Otherwise I, I think they're there to learn volleyball. And I, I really feel like you said, you can, you can coach on the fly. You can coach during play and you can just keep going and just, it does not need to be. I mean, I, I stopped the group earlier today, the entire group. So all three courts that are like our lead session, but it was like 15 seconds. I like got their attention quickly and then we're like back in it, like balls in the air, literally five seconds later. And I feel that type of thing like focuses the group. If I feel like it's something I'm seeing on every court, the same mistake, then I can't go talk to each of them and I'll just, we'll just pause it. Um, myself and like two others of the 20 ish coaches we have, or I kind of allow them to do that. And it's just gotta be quick, but yeah, it, the no lines, constant feedback, um, you know, this or that. I mean, I, we talked and I don't know how you do with this, but like I've coached while playing a lot and it's hard not to like lean up against the post or like take a knee or like if you had a chair, how great would it be to sit in that chair? Like I'm a believer that you got to be standing and being engaged. And mm -hmm. I want coaches that want to be there and can, can rock those two hours. So it's Man, hard. We would get a hard, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. beach for a little I, while. We, I think we do on some stuff. I think that's also <laughs> one way to do it. I mean, I've been going like this would be year 13. I know you're in there deep too. Like there's a reason why it works and you know, it's gotta be kind of hold yourself accountable. And, and yeah. Uh, so did you, did you buy your land? Uh, do you, or you use it from the city? Uh, how did, how did you go about that when you started your club? So we have a beach. That's a great question. Cause I, I don't know your world that well in Hermosa, but I've heard some rumblings. We have a beach location that's run by a local city, the city of Del Mar. And so we've been permitted since day one. I did not jump around that hoop. We knew we had to. It's a really small beach, so we weren't able to anyway. Mm -hmm. But we have permits through the city of Del Mar for our beach location. And there, it's like an ongoing process right now. We're in like year two of like a five-year arm. Um, we obviously pay for it. I think it's reasonable. Uh, would I like to play less? Yes, but I think it's not like a total gouge. And 
it gives us like, you know, if there's locals on the court or whatever, we have the ability like, hey, we, you know, we have these courts permitted from these times and can run practice because it'd be terrible to be somewhere where you get kicked out and then you got to go, you know, circle back to all those families. Mm. Um, the place that I'm actually taking this meeting with is our uh, wave volleyball. And we have three outdoor sand courts and the land is leased from the state of California for this one. Uh, leased from the state of California. Pretty much. It's a really unique situation. It's right there at the Dumbo Fairgrounds. So it's like this CA 22 something, to be honest. I don't know all the details. I know that we have another five plus years on this current extension and our whole facility, even like I'm in the indoor facility, it's like one of those, those tents. Yeah. And there is only a certain amount of concrete on this build because it needs to be temporary to a certain extent. Uh, so, so it might be like military owned or, or federal owned. I, I worked in a sports performance place like that where we had an airfield that a, a sports facility built it, but they couldn't build a pool because they said within 24 hours, if there's a national emergency, everything needs to be able to be vacated. And I was like, I don't think it's military. I know it's not military. I don't know the reasoning, but it is like because of the lease situation, they want, I think, to be able to bounce a tenant if need be and like start back. This was like this. The one we're sitting on was a piece of dirt. Okay. So it got built from the ground up. We have an angel investor that's amazing that loves volleyball and is able to make this happen. Um, but this one is not cheap either. I'd love to pay a lot less for this one. But at the same time, it has lights. We can play till 10 o'clock at night. And this thing is this thing is moving and grooving. What did um, you do before you could afford that? You know, like only only at the beach location. Okay. So I ran the club from the beach from day one, and then five years ago we have the second facility. Um, we still run practices at both. Uh, we've actually started to near maximize this facility, like Monday through Friday. Mm -hmm. uh, weekends are still pretty vacant. Um, some tournaments here and there and some odd practices, but we're not a club, even the indoor that like has a lot of weekend practices. Yeah. Just try to create that balance a little bit with our coaches and families. Um, but, are you guys ever running clinics or, or invites where adults or juniors could uh, come into Del Mar and hire you, jump on your court, you know, kind of open, open invite for, for Californians? Do you, do you keep it kind of anyone visiting California or do you keep it tight knit between your club? No. What opportunities would somebody take advantage of to maybe get coached by you or your staff? Yeah, yeah totally wide open. We have like open door policy for adults, youth, all levels. Um, right now, there's like weekly camps going on. You can jump on a weekly camp. We have people that come in all the time. Either they just register or they ask me like, hey, we're only visiting on these dates or whatever. Like we have, we call them drop-ins. Um, during like the, you know, the right after the post COVID shutdown and the cohorts and all that, we were unable to do that, but now we're back to what we've done where it's open door policy. Um, Mike Plachek, we've mentioned multiple times in this podcast does all of our adults. And so we have like a Friday morning, he's got like a standing Friday morning group. You need to get an eval with him before he invites you into that because it's like a little higher level of play. So that's kind of cool. charge for the evals. No, most evals are free uh, for the youth. It's free uh, for adults. I think it's pretty much a keepers take a lesson. Okay. Um, I honestly don't know where that's at yet. I think it's about 80 a person for an hour. Um, mm -hmm. And then the, the he's they're all a lot of them are con independent contractors. So I don't know exactly what they charge. Um, our sessions for like a youth range from like 30 to 33 for a two hour practice, depending if it's that like hour 45 or the uh, uh, two hour practice. Nice. And what's the, what's the name of the website for everybody listening so they can uh, it's find it? Wave, find yeah, wavevb.com. Nice. And I know that we have uh, your Instagram down below. I think it's Beach Olson, right? At Beach Olson. Yeah, my Instagram's pretty much dead these days. Someone <laughs> like, I, I had one during playing and I had, a, I don't know, whatever, more followers. And then it got like hijacked or whatever it got and just lost that thing. And since then I've resorted back to like another one. I just, to be honest, I'm never on it. I'm not too worried about it. Nice. So, okay. So yeah. Wave, wavevb.com. That's yep. where uh, That's everybody it. can find out and, and see your facilities and see your programs. And uh, if adults or juniors are coming into town and they want to get some reps down in Cali. No yeah, here, I'll, give you, I'll give everyone a little sneak tour. So indoor is that way. Where is that thing? Can you see it? Yep. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Cool. And then there's me again. And then Coach Mike and some athletes are right out there. Uh, wow. There you go. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, wow. kind of cool, right? It's beautiful. So that's where I've been like side looking sometimes, seeing what's going on out there. 
As we talked earlier, that's uh, Miles Partain sitting out there playing right now. So kind of cool having having that group. That's great. Uh, do you have any next steps that you're sharing? Any projects that you're getting involved in, or things that you want people to pay attention to? Um, I just think for I just keep it super volleyball specific right now is that um, the beach world is like constantly evolving. And the they're doing pairs championships now from the college level in the fall, which is great. They just expanded the college championship from eight to 16 teams, which is amazing. And there's a big push right now at the junior level for this club versus club format where a program brings five pairs and they compete against other clubs pairs and like a college format. So just kind of get a little volley geeked up about that and just we have our fall program starting the 22nd of this month and so just kind of you know we go year round and just getting back into the next part of it and trying to make uh, local san diegans better at beach volleyball and kind of enjoying the ride like so that. there you go yeah all right well i got two last questions for you matt uh, i know that keeping you still for an hour and a half is uh, no, you're good. an you're accomplishment good. by me <laughs> yeah. i'm enjoying it so it works cool uh the the best the piece of advice that you received that you've held on to the most throughout the years, the one piece of advice that you've got from somebody that, that really applied in your career as a player, as a person, the most. I don't think it's like, can you put on a t-shirt anytime soon? But again, Kevin Wong was a partner I played with for two full seasons and I really enjoyed our time together. He was about 10 years older than me. So I think wiser as well. And he, not all the time, but mentioned no freebies is something he often said. And I've thought about that a ton. It sounds kind of random, but when I'll break it down for you, this, there's no nothing free in life, no freebies was his thing. And so it was like our working out or it was like the lack of training or like a business, like I mentioned, like beach volleyball is a total grind. And pretty much everyone I talk to right now is just grinding and whatever walk of life they're in. I think that everyone's looking for like, not, I don't think everyone, I'm not I mean to run on this tangent, but that everyone's looking for the easy fix and the quick fix. And like, I literally, my brain just goes back to Kevin Wong telling me there's no freebies. And like, if there's something you're passionate about, like wonderful, like start working at it because I don't know. Some people have some amazing situations. I think a lot of people grind and they work through the, the hard times. And I think you mentioned marriage. I've been married 18 years this August. Like there's times where it's not easy. And like, again, there's no freebies. I wish you would have said something a little cooler, but it's something that's like stuck with me forever. And I just think all walks of life. And I just, I, I, I really like that one. So, and I'm like big, like quotes. I mentioned you off air, like some quotes I was reading. Like I know all the, like the bigger wooden kind of John Wooden stuff. I, I bounce a ton of those, um, you know, a big like handshake, eye contact, all that fun stuff. So I think there's, I don't know, but Kevin Wong, no freebies. I've used I like that it. all the time and yeah, there you go. I like that. And, you know, I see kind of a lot of the things that, that I invested in was going there and doing the work first and then hoping that it would it'd become something, you know, you know, red shirting in college, you put in the work to go there. You know, when I first went to college, I, I chose a place that I said, now I'm going to get my butt kicked for two years to hope that I can start by my junior year. That was always my mentality and the same thing with internships. And now, and, and I know you're looking for some kind of customer service and, and, and service people to, to help, to help grow your club and, and make some things easier and, I'm looking for the same type of people and hopefully we can both find some people. So if you guys are out there and you love the admin side of things and customer service and helping people, please reach out to me and Matt both. <laughs> we're, we're looking for you. Um, but people don't, you know, I, I think people forget that you want to invest for a little while to show somebody what you can do with the hope that, that that will become something instead of coming to an employer, coming to a team and saying, what can the team give me? What can the employer give me? It's show up, get it done. And there's no doubt that they'll have to keep you around, you know, make yourself so indispensable to your team, to your coach, to your employer, that it's, man, they're begging you to stick around instead of you know begging you to show up in the first place. I'm going to go off that right now because I was just talking to my business partner and owner of Wave Volleyball. His name is Brennan Dean. 
and we both pride ourselves in you know putting in the time and doing the little things, et cetera. And we were talking about something that if the volleyball world were to flip upside down or we had to do a different career or whatever, like to your point right there, and I feel like you're in the same boat that I have zero question that if I walk into Starbucks down the street or whatever, like you can start me wherever you want, but like it's gonna be a matter of time that I'm like near the top, if not. Like, does that, I don't know, I don't want to sound arrogant, um, but I feel like I'm going to put in the time and I'm going to make my worth valuable to you and like try to learn and like be cool. I like that one. And be cool. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I just, for what it's worth, I think everyone, a lot of people, I, and I have some wonderful coaches with us right now, but everyone wants everything like right off the bat. And like, to your point, it's like, well, got to prove your worth a little bit. So I think just kind of, I know it's a tough time right now that everyone's working hard and costs are up and et cetera. But I think if we just kind of keep grinding and keep working hard, good things will happen. Yeah. And there's, I don't, there's a feeling of a little more reward in that. Like start me from the bottom. Let me show you. Because yeah. I, I want the little bonus merits of coming up to the next group, coming up to the next group, moving another position. That feels better than starting at a higher position and then being afraid to lose it. You know, and then if even if you transfer companies, it's like, all right, we, we've got a, now a pretty big online following. And, and you're the same way when you were talking about the kids don't know who a pro player is. So you have to show up for that individual. And even though we've got a, a big following, every person who sees our video or comes to our website for the first time, we have to prove ourselves to that person every single day to the new person. You know, we can't ride on any reputation or anything that we've built because each new person this is their first time meeting us so we have to prove ourselves over again and that's that's something that we tell to our our coaches and, and everybody working in our companies hey we need to show up as if this were their first time meeting them they have no idea who we are like how do we get that person to be happy to get to the next level and to and to you know progress them in their live or their athletic endeavors yeah no, I think that's another one of those little quotes is like, you know, you have one chance to make a first impression. So it's that same and it's the same thing over and over and over. Uh, that's why I take, to be honest, like an extra second or whatever, read through the emails I'm about to send. I try to proofread things. I try to put like a little more, not just like being super blunt and like, you know, no to this or yes to that. Like I, people give me a hard time. Like, yeah, you shouldn't that's write emails. Default is, is the bluntness. I, I, yeah, I, I think I don't, like, again, oh, no, I have to decorate this you know, a little bit. As big as our club is or isn't, however you want to look at it, like these people are reaching out, like I feel just putting that little extra personal touch like you're talking about, I think is I think what you're talking about is is really important in my opinion. And I feel like I'm like burning it at both ends and unable to do that. Then I'll take a step back and like kind of check myself. But I think that part of the the company and the customer service and the relations is is really important. Cool. Hey, well, that, that pretty much covers. Yeah. Yeah. So what is it? I'm looking at the notes, the comments on the side. I, I haven't been keeping uh, track. But someone's asking me, <laughs> talk about setters, please. What does that mean? What do you think? Talk about setters, please. See that? Best player around. I see a bunch of people saying that you're the best player around. That's my boy. That's my boy, Thomas Brazier. Thomas, if you want that job, I will hire you right now. I've actually thought about reaching out to you like two weeks ago and hiring you remotely. Thomas is amazing. He's so good. <laughs> He's a man. But right below that, it says Kid. Is it Kidak? Yeah, Thomas is giving some love back. Thomas, I love you, buddy. Uh, it says talk about setters. I don't know what that says, but I'm going to take 30 more seconds. You cool if I go down this path real quick? Go for it. Yeah. Okay. So I talked early. Uh, I think it was in the same podcast. I can't remember if it was when Mark and I were off or not. But the. The setting is everything if it's what you're focused in. I was so into setting when I was playing. It's all I wanted to do. I wanted to head and set before I was able to. And I am such a big advocate of squaring up. I think actually Mark doesn't always square up, if I remember correctly. you got all sorts of cool, like, flair stuff you can do. I am, like, all squared up all the time, trying to make the same contact, getting your feet to the ball. Like, I just had, I just had passion about my hand setting. And I spent a ton of time practicing it. I mentioned earlier that I played with Jake Gibb for one tournament. I spent like four days prior to that tournament, like taking his set, setting his set indoors to try to perfect it because it was that really high one that I had a hard time with. Mm -hmm. So I think, and I mentioned earlier, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole of like what the current level of setting is. I think there's some crazy athletes out there. I have a really hard time watching the chowder set get be accepted. Um, personally, I'm not trying to say we change the rules, but if you're asking my opinion, but I feel that just take pride in your setting, work on it and get a coach like Mark and his team to help you perfect it. 
it's not rocket science. And then if you square up, get your feet there and, you know, just work on your release, then it can, can happen. And I have no idea if that's what that guy was asking about, but it's going to be good <laughs> so. Do you think, do you think it, uh, at lower levels, uh, they should not call handsets? You know, should they wait until A or double A to call handsets? I've always had that theory that like, we need people to not be afraid to try it. Um, and I, I think it, I think it's held the country back in terms of like where we could have been with hand setting because so many levels don't even attempt it because they're afraid to to lose a point. But do you think we should have the same standard all across the board, or should maybe a B level allow any type of hand setting? But then once you get to A or double A, then then you can start calling doubles. So I think it should be loose at certain levels. And I'm, I think it's fine. The AVP is as loose as they are, or whatever you want to call it. Um, I, I think it, what I've seen to answer your question, I know I'm, I'm with the youth more than you are is, or I think is that um, it was super tight. Let's call it three years ago, super tight. No one is hand setting and it got looser, like it's way looser. And honestly, like almost everyone is hand setting at like a medium to higher level youth. It's amazing. Like they are, they are freaking good. Yeah. And it's not like they're really good. It's not like nothing's being called. It's just that if they're facing, it comes out reasonably fast that it's not being called with some spin. And I think that's great. Um, again, going further down this conversation, what I do have a hard time with is how quick the AVP and some others are, even at the youth level to calling what they're calling a lift. I think I don't understand if absolute fast, like you get, you said your guys a super fast, like indoor setter. If super fast can get away with quite a bit of spin, I do not understand personally why someone who's trained with their hands and takes it in a little to your point and then gets called on a lift. And I watched the Hermosa open like Paul Lottman. He actually is at some of the trains at our facility, yeah. but he got called on a couple, like they called it a lift. I honestly, I, I could not see it. I didn't understand. It wasn't like a big hold, like my boy, Kevin McCullough back in the day. Yeah. Like, He's got some nice hands. Oh, oh yeah. Control deep, is so nice. <laughs> you like him. You like that slow. I love playing with Kevin. Uh, but that's my point is I feel like you're squared up like fast or take it in a little. I feel like take it in a little should be just as fine as like fast and chowder in my opinion. Um, yeah, let's, let's let them hand set. Like why let's not pause the game. If it comes out like absolute helicopter, I'm sorry, it should be called, but, um, uh, that's my point. Yeah. And basketball never reverted to like slapping at the ball instead of actually dribbling it. So like, why, why did we have to make this change? I'm, I'm, I'm with it. And, and AVP is definitely behind FIVB. FIVB went nuts with mm. calling lifts right. immediately the lifts and right yeah crazy so the the avp is is a little bit looser they're, they're not sprinting towards that like the world tour did um but you get you get your phantom calls every now and then and you're just like yeah you're gonna i think it's okay i love i love the progression of the sport i wish we'd stop changing all the rules but again no one's asking me and that's totally fine i'll keep supporting it from from where i'm at what we're doing so it's good nice all right hey matt uh, I kept you a lot longer than we agreed on. <laughs> so, so thank you. No, no worries. Appreciate All right. It. Right on Mark. Thank you so much, dude. I appreciate it. Hopefully uh, something comes of this and I'm super stoked for you and your business is awesome. And the fact you're still playing through this and now you're married and running a business, they should be, we could flip the tide and you could be answering all these same questions you asked me because you're, you're rocking it, buddy. Nice job. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Matt, guys, go find him at wavevb.com. Reach out. Uh, he's open to adult training, juniors training, and, of course, uh, he's got one of the largest, if not the largest, beach volleyball club in the U.S. So great guy to reach out to and just like we did, pick his brain, get some knowledge when they're willing to, uh, to share it. Really appreciate you, man. Cool. Right on. You guys well. Thank you so much. All right. Have a good one. Yeah, you as well. Really cool interview there, guys. Um, me and Matt, actually, we, we played maybe for three years uh, along the same. We had uh, a little bit of crossing there in our careers. And he was, at that time, he was the older guard that everybody was looking to, that everybody said, Matty O, Matty O, Matty O. You know? And when I went down to San Diego my first few years, you know, he was one of those guys that everybody was talking about. And 
when I look at the progression of his career, what he did and what he's capable of now and how big of a club he's got, he's one of the guys that I, you know, secretly <laughs> follow and, and check out what he's doing. And it, I love that we get this little platform where I can actually, actually pick his brain and get some advice and mentorship from him. Uh, and, and remember, you know, that it's, we talk about a little bit about mentorship and there was something on Instagram that I, looked at a little while ago and I said, to be a coach, you only need to be 10% ahead of the person who is learning from you, right? You just need to be able to guide them to just the next step. You don't have to guide them the full way. And I have a lot of coaches reaching out to me on Instagram and on Facebook who are thinking about starting programs or want to uh, to start classes or want to grow beach volleyball in their community, but they feel like they don't have the clout. They feel like they don't have the reputation. And I'll tell you right now that if you open yourself up and you say, Hey, I'm running this, I'm going to run an hour and a half of setting reps for whoever wants to join. Once you put yourself in that situation and you know, just a little bit more, or even if you don't know more, think about Rich Lamburn right? Who was coaching Jake, um, Jake Gibb and Casey Patterson and then Taylor Crabb. This is a coach who really hadn't played that much beach, but was able to, all right, now he's got knowledge of defense. He's got knowledge of blocking from indoor for me and national team libero. And he's able to provide all of this information. So the, the short story is you don't need to be so far ahead of somebody in order to be able to help them. Anybody can help anyone at any point. And if you want to become a coach and you're just 10% ahead of somebody, fine. If you're an intermediate or an advanced player, guess what? You get to coach beginners, somebody who's brand new to the sport. If you want to learn how to do that, if you want to learn how to coach, how to start a volleyball business, that's part of one of my pet projects that I'm jumping into. I'd like to mentor some people who are trying to grow the community that they have, the community around them. Um, it, and I've got a bunch of experience now uh, from blogging to creating a YouTube channel, creating successful Instagram channel, classes, private lessons, camps, and clinics. So I think I might be 10% ahead of somebody else. So if you wanna learn how to coach, um, I'm here, reach out, shoot me a DM, and let's see if uh, we can create another little community of people who want to grow the game in their community. All right. We are currently, our online players are currently in the middle of their ultimate defender course, which uh, is an eight week defensive master class. If you want to look at what that looks like, go to betteratpeach.com forward slash ultimate defender ultimate defender. That is our defensive masterclass. It is recorded videos plus recorded videos plus you have the opportunity for two live meetings per week uh, with a coach and with another group of players where we do a lot of film analysis including your film analysis because at the meetings and in the course we tell you what drills to do at home or on the court we modify it for you no matter where you are and then when you post it onto our private Facebook group, we actually coach you and we show you what you're doing wrong, what you're doing right, and how to progress to the next level. So we have recorded courses, but we also have our membership where you're working in real time with real coaches. You post your videos, you post your technique, your workouts, and we get in there and we help get you to the next level. We study your technique and we show you how to do it in our private Facebook group. You're more than welcome to just take the recorded course. That's why we built it. But I think the meet and being able to connect with other players in a community and get to that next level, I think that's what separates us being able to work with our coaching staff. Another little side note from me, if you know Facebook ads, if you know Instagram ads, Google ads, please reach out. We're trying to get the word out to as many people as we can about the programs because these programs did not exist when I was coming through my career. And I know that there are a lot of people that are still trying to get themselves to the next level, but they don't quite know how to get there. So we've done a pretty good job when you search on Google that you can find a lot of our videos, but people don't know how uh, in depth we run our coaching program. So those ads would help us grow. 
And we are currently looking for some customer service people who can tour people through our programs and introduce them and making sure that they succeed. And if you are a beach volleyball coach or you want to learn how to be one, we have opportunities. Um, those opportunities involve getting players to the next level through online coaching and mentorship. And uh, we have some commission-based sales if you want to get into some sales and help us grow better at beach and we think that uh, we can hit a lot of different avenues from online courses to clinics to camps to coaching clinics and people who are starting their own volleyball businesses so if you are shy about reaching out this is your invite dm me shoot me an email okay you can reach out to me at mark burrick on instagram that's a good way or you can visit our facebook group we've got 10,500 people in there it's called volley chat get better at beach volleyball that is a great way to stay up to date with anything that we have going on and finally our first camp is sold out the october 30th camp in florida is sold out we still have space in our other camps we have uh, one in November, one in December, uh, one at the end of December, and one in January. And we will try to add some in February, March, April. If you want to come hang out with us and play volleyball all day, every day for seven days, training under pros, under great coaches, as well as being able to play in mini tournaments and hang out and meet people from all over the country and world. That's the place to go. And I'll tell you right now, thank you to my friends from the camps who have put me up, me and Brandon put me up at all of our tournaments. Um, it's an amazing community. So if you get into that Facebook group, Volley Chat, Get Better at Beach Volleyball, it is connecting players all across the world and all across the country so that if you're traveling or if you're going to another city, you say, hey, who is a volleyball player in Richmond, Virginia? I'm looking for some sand games. Boom. You know, you're going to get that answer. So at our camps and on our Facebook group, you get to connect with people and make true, true, true friends from all over the world, all over the country, and uh, keep it in the volleyball family. So I know that's a lot of announcements. Um, I'm really happy I got to hang out with Matt for a little while. I hope you guys got a lot out of it. And as always, reach out to me if you want to become a member and you want to interact with me on a regular basis. Go to betteratbeach.com forward slash coaching. And if you're just looking for a free drill book, we have our 36 best beach volleyball drills. You go to betteratbeach.com forward slash free beach volleyball drill book. Is that right? No. Oh, give me a second. I actually forgot it right now. Yes, betteratbeach.com forward slash free beach volleyball drill book. Uh, you'll get our on our email list and we'll send you our 36 best beach volleyball drills along with a ton of our favorite videos um, in your email and our podcast episodes as well. If you haven't yet, subscribe to our podcast, like it, share it, do all the fun things, send it to uh, the volleyball player that you want to play with or want to partner with and um, it helps us go a long way. So thank you guys so much for your time. Enjoyed hanging out. Uh, reach out if you want, love to talk to you. Have a good one and I'll see you on the